But I also understand they are well-behaved children. <laughs> so, Doctor, the question is, the question is, what are you doing that that some other parents are yeah. failing to do? Sure. Um, I think marry well, um, and is probably the first suggestion if you if you can. Um, I do I do feel you know really really blessed. My wife Katie is um, is tremendous. I mean, she is um, probably every. Uh, personal statement I've ever written. She's the grammarian behind making sure that it all, you know, flows well and looks well. Um, but she's also the heart of our family unit too. So, um, so I don't know that I have a particular secret or, or who's been telling you about about my kids' well behavior. They've just caught me at really good moments because certainly there are challenging times thrown in there um, as well. But I think, you know, um, I think actually in some ways we're a good balance for each other in that. Her upbringing, she was raised by doctors and then studied theology, and I was raised by, you know, a pastor and became a doctor later on. So I think in some ways we the were reverse. probably um, groomed for one another, right. actually, and um, and so hopefully that's translated into helping us in parenting. So, Doc, tell us, what do you see as the biggest mistakes parents make today? Yeah, biggest mistakes. So, you know, and, and maybe I wouldn't care to ca categorize it as a mistake as much as a maybe just an, an oversight or things that parents aren't, aren't aware of. And that is, um, I think there's a great pull at, that is interfering sometimes in the child and family relationship. And what I mean is um, our lives are really busy. And I think that's always been the case, that people have been, you know, running here and there and had sports and extracurricular activities. But I think, you know, both with with technology and um, and those types of things, while wonderful and splendid, and certainly you'll find them, uh, you know, in my home as well, with you know games and devices and things like that. I think there is kind of a an unspoken um, thief of sorts that can sometimes steal time away from uh, families really bonding and connecting in the ways that they used to. So I'll give you just a, a short example. You know, I think the when I think of families and how they persevere and thrive, you know, if a, if a mom and a teen um, were to have an argument, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, the teen storms off to their room, the parent storms off to their room, and then later on, because there's nowhere else to go and nothing else to do, they there's a chance, an opportunity for them to come back together and to resolve or work through or move through. And again, you know, I'm, that's the ideal situation. Sometimes it's days and weeks of cold treatment before you get there. Um, I think now there's an opportunity for children to, you know, retreat to their room, process with friends, but never make it to that next step of the family, of the child and the parent getting together again to resolve and move forward together. And so I think that's one of the things that that we probably underestimate um, in our current time. And it's something that our parents couldn't, told of, couldn't have prepared us for because that wasn't a, a potential obstacle then. All right, so you are a child psychiatrist. Yes. But when, you, when the child has a problem, so quote problem, people tend to first think about a social worker or a psychologist. Why a psychiatrist? Yes, that's a really great question. Um, so it turns out that um, there are some there are some additional tools that can be helpful in helping us to understand how children are are getting along and and some of the difficulties they're having. And so we know that having someone to help a child and a family gain insight into their emotional lives can be really transformative in a child's life. Sometimes, even with really great skills and tools that we try to you know, give to kids and to families, they can still encounter problems that require a little bit more um, to help their brains and bodies respond uh, appropriately. And then that's where um, it can be helpful to also think about you know, medication being a, a role in that. Sometimes, too, the, that our role as psychiatrists, um, which is unique and I enjoy doing as well, is that we get to do a little bit of detective work. So there are certain things and certain medical conditions, too, that mask as primarily a behavior thing or look mostly like a mood thing. And so, um, so sometimes when families are meeting me, they're surprised to learn that, you know, I'm ordering tests and things to also rule out other organic things that can be going on in a child's um, body that can also make them struggle in ways that they don't foresee. To what extent do young people now have different problems or say more severe problems than those of past generations? Um, you know, I think, I think probably the, the problems are the same. Um, 
pretty much the, the same, but I think the degree or intensity of certain parts of those um, can be magnified depending on the culture and time that families find themselves in. Um, with my family, so we just finished, we'll uh, occasionally just kind of pick up a, a book and read, you know, a chapter or so uh, at dinner time. And we finished one called Seven Alone, in which, you know, these uh, seven children are, um, are migrating, you know, west. So this is really early, um, early America. And so it's funny hearing my children laugh at the things that they get upset at each other about, you know, these siblings who are, who are trying to do it on their, uh, on their own. And so I think there are a lot of things that, that parallel. Um, in terms of um, what's different about some of the struggles, I think um, in terms of connectedness, um, in terms of feeling kind of bonded one to another, I think that's really heightened in this, in this time. And it's something that's actually maybe counterintuitive or would have been counterintuitive to me. Um, and probably the way that I put it in context is, you know, when I visit my youngest brother in New York City, or when I when I did, you know, um, a year or two ago, um, you could be surrounded by people and still feel lonely, just because you know, not from any ill will, but people are focused and you're in a sea of people, but um, but you can still feel kind of alone in in that. And I think um, our our children, I, I notice a little bit more of that, sometimes struggling against the tide when we think that you know, they're more supported and more connected, um, but they feel like they're surrounded. I, I, I see them almost as a, as a child in New York who's surrounded by people, but sometimes struggling to find those really strong connections. So if a person feels lonely in the group, what is her next step? Yeah, so I think number one is um, I love the family system. I think that's the first that's the first net, and if we can make that strong, then that's the first um, that's the first place to see if we can't kind of enrich and help that that unit to function better together. And so that might mean you know more more um, family movie nights and uh, and puzzle and playing Uno, or sometimes you know a parent knocking on the door and watching YouTube with their child with you know and eating uh, a bowl of Cheerios sitting side by side with one another. So. So I think that's the that's my first and kind of primary response. If there's a way for the family to kind of fill that that void, that can be helpful. And then I think moving out from there, so looking at the other uh, fields of influence um, and interest in a child's life, and then finding some way to to meet that as best as you can. So, doctor, what are the most common challenges that your patients face today? Sure. And would COVID be blamed for those challenges? Okay. Um, that's a really good question and, and perhaps a, a challenging one, actually. I think um, probably the, the greater majority of, of kids um, that I see today um, is probably more heavily cited towards anxiety, um, depression, and ADHD. Again, I see a, a lot of other things too, trauma and whatnot, but, but those are probably the biggest three. Um, in terms of their vulnerability during this last year with COVID, um, I think I wouldn't blame COVID for their struggle, but it certainly has exposed some vulnerabilities and, and intensified some of those things. So if I had a child um, who, you know, a year ago we uh, might've evaluated and, and might not have recommended even therapy or medication or, you know, more uh, testing, um, I've had some come back in this time and, and really find themselves struggling and maybe we have needed to, you know, think of a more intensive plan to help them. Despite the challenges, you're still hopeful for the future. I am. I Describe am. that light at the end of the tunnel. Sure. I think, um, thankfully, uh, humanity is, is very resilient. And, um, and so when I, when I take a look at, um, at where our ancestors have, have come through and what they've persevered through, through pay, plagues and famine and, and, uh, and, and wars, it makes me hopeful that you know the human, uh, when posed with some really uh, threatening things that tends to that that threatens to kind of limit their world and limit their life, that we find a way to hold on to the things that matter most and and persevere um, and find goodness and light. And so um, and so I I'm not alone in in music making. My patients come in and tell me, yeah, I've been uh, you know writing new songs or doing poetry or um, or now that um, you know now now I really am interested in going to soccer. I mean, last year my parents put me in it and I was grateful for COVID to strike in the spring, but now actually I'm, I'm really longing for that connection. Do you have a psychiatric profile of yourself? Uh, that is a really good question. I don't think that I, so I will say this. Um, 
be part of psychiatric training and supervision. So as a, as a psychiatrist, you know, me medicine is still very much an apprenticeship. So you see a patient and you talk to your attending who's been doing it for years and years and years. The unspoken uh, thing that happens in psychiatry is that you're also getting insight about yourself when you're in supervision. So I think all psychiatrists in the back of their mind are you know, thinking, I think my, my, my supervisor is, is probably evaluating me as well. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that you're uh, led to, to understand and that helps you as a clinician is how you feel in the exchange. Right, so there are certain you know, personality types that might make you feel upset or sad or frustrated. And so often in supervision, you're, you know, the attending would say, how did that make you feel? And you'd think, oh, are you trying to analyze my feelings? But actually, that ends up being a diagnostic tool for you. So I probably do, in my mind, have a, have a profile for myself, um, both of what my tendencies are, and then how I interpret those, those feelings or moods based on what I'm seeing or doing.